very excited to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Alex Hoffman. He studied uh, and received his uh, undergraduate degree from Cambridge University, studying physics and molecular biology. He then went to work with David Baltimore, both at MIT and Caltech. And we recruited him here, what, about a year ago? Yep. Just about a year ago, uh, Victoria Sork recruited him here from UCSD to be a professor in the microbiology, immunology, and molecular genetics department and to head up a new unit on campus, and I want to get it right, the UCLA Institute for Quantitative and Computational Biosciences. I'm sure you've all heard and read about big data, and I'm sure you've all heard and read about quantitative biology and, and some of those types of things. What Alex does is he combines the biology with his mathematical training to really better understand the entire system. Back in the dark ages, when I started my career, you could study one protein and one gene and its regulation for a good long time. We didn't have the kinds of tools to generate images, sequence data, patient records, the kinds of things that we have available to us now. And I think that the power of harnessing those big data sets and that information is, it's hard to overestimate how this is going to impact medicine. So I'm really excited that Alex is here. He's hit the ground running. He's done a lot already. And he's going to talk to us today about making medicine more personal, precise, and predictive. So thank you so much, Alex. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you for that kind introduction, uh, Judy, and uh, thank you to the um, uh, organizing committee uh, for uh, providing me with this amazing honor to speak to you and um, share some of our ideas about uh, how we can contribute to making medicine more personal, precise, and predictive. And uh, as when I picked this title and it, and it appeared on various, various note, uh, uh, notice boards, some of my colleagues were making fun of me because, of course, ultimately my training was really as a physicist and as a biochemist, so what do I know about medicine? <laughs> but what, do I, what I know is that medicine is about people. And why are they blue? Actually? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not quite sure, but... <laughs> They don't appear blue on my screen, <laughs> but um, they're about people, and yet uh, many way, in the way that we attempt to provide therapies, uh, of course they're the, 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 good, uh, the good old therapies of sleeping more, eating better, relaxing, doing yoga, but there are also the therapies that are, mo that are molecular. And this is really, I think, a fundamental disconnect. Health is about a whole person. And yet the, the therapies that we are providing, that we are attempting to develop, are at a much smaller scale than molecular. And so there is this disconnect. There, is, there are the genes and the molecules that are generated from, from the DNA and the genes. And and health happens at a, at a much larger scale. And, the, <clears throat> and so human health fundamentally is multi-scale and it's really the, uh, the result of very complex interactions. And we know many of these through the studies of the last 100 years, many of them here at UCLA, of how genes give rise to proteins, and there's a lot of regulation there, how these proteins are interacting with each other through very complex molecular networks, and how these molecular networks in every little cell give rise to the cell's functions, whether this is a neutrophil chasing after bacterium. Here's a little bacterium, and I, that movie I can't show you right now, but um, of, of this neutrophil chasing the bacterium and eating it up. And how these cells then together form organs, and the organs together function in a concerted way to pro to provide us with health. And when things go wrong at any of these levels, that's, really, that's when disease results. So this complexity of from going from molecules to human health, I think is, is something that's really 
it's, it's really astounding and it's really, it's, it's really what is keeping us so busy. And so here's another way to describe this complexity of going from atoms to nucleotides to DNA to chromatin to cell nucleus to cell body, red blood cells, and these are all of these different scales from nanometers to micrometers and to centimeters to meters. And of course, uh, and here, uh, here's again that scale. It's a billion fold length scale, and it's also actually maybe less well appreciated, it's a billion fold time scale. Molecules move at much, at incredibly fast rates, Brownian motion, dynamics of atoms interacting with each other in, at, at femtosecond uh, resolution. And then of course, networks and cells move still very fast, but slower than that, and animals and organisms at another scale. And so, <clears throat> How do we integrate all of this? How, how do we understand animals in terms of the molecules? Because it's at the level of the molecules that drugs are really affecting ultimately the health of the animal or the human. So what can we, I've got this picture, what can we learn from groundhog? <laughs> we can learn from groundhog is that on a certain date, Depending on what the weather is, there is a prediction that we can make about six weeks later. So what does this have to do with biology? And maybe that other example. This guy's blue too. <laughs> I think everybody is blue in my... <laughs> but um, <clears throat> I think what we can learn from this is that actually there are events that are not... That, oh, where the weather on that day and whether winter is prolonged or not, we don't really understand what the connection is. But if, there's a, but if there is a statistical correlation between the two, then this could be predictive of the next, even if we don't understand what the actual, what the actual connection is. Now, and this, this may be a bad example because, of course, the predictive power of observing the weather on February 2nd may not be particularly high. It may, be, it may often be wrong. And yet, the, you know, I'm trying to illustrate the idea of a statistical correlation that we can make molecular measurements that in some way predict disease outcome or whether a particular drug will work. And without really understanding what is in between. And we can do that if we have a lot of measurements over here and we can make a lot of measurements over there and we can establish a correlation. <clears throat> and so that is what's called a statistical model, a statistical correlation. And so medicine's full of those. For example, we, are, we now know, or, or we now know that a certain molecular event where there is a mutation in this particular DNA sequence one of the three billion nucleotides in the genome. If that mutation occurs, cells that are normally looking like this will look like that and will lead to sickle cell disease. And this is 100% accurate. And this correlation can be established without really knowing what the reason for this is. In this case, actually, we do know the reason, and Don Cohn here has made incredible contributions in developing gene therapy tools to correct this change, this mutation. Other biomarkers may not be 100% accurate, but they're still pretty accurate. For example, the, you, the very well-known BRCA1, BRCA2 genes predispose people to cancer. How much do they predispose people to cancer? Well, here is a statistic that says that uh, by age 50, of the normal population, 2% people will develop breast cancer. But those who have a BRCA1, BRCA2 mutation, there's 33 to 50% of the people who will develop breast cancer. By age 70, things look worse. And this is what caused some famous people to take drastic measures. 
and maybe for good reason. But it is not perfectly accurate, it's pretty accurate. And the reason why it's pretty, and so it is pretty accurate, and so we actually understand why it is accurate. We hear, we actually know what BRCA1 and BRCA2 do. BRCA1 is a protein that plays a role in DNA repair. And if that protein is mutated, the normal damage the DNA sustains all the time is not being repaired as easily. And so that makes sense, that that would then lead to genomic, further genomic instability and therefore predispose cells to cancer. But there are some biomarkers whose predictive power is really limited because many diseases are incredibly complex. So here is, here's some charts that I took from the literature about how well chemotherapy treatments work for particular leukemias in which the cells have a biomarker called BCL2 either at a low level or at a high level and you can see that the patients whether they have a low or high level don't, it's really hard to distinguish. In this case we see that those people who have a high level of this protein do tend to do more poorly. So this, is a, this biomarker has some predictive power, not very high, but probably useful, and these other ones don't. And in this case, we don't really know why these proteins, why this protein has predictive power. There is a complete, we, we don't understand the reason for it. In the case of BRCA1, we do understand a little bit about DNA repair. In this case, we don't. And there are many such biomarkers that are useful in the clinic. They have some predictive power. That the predictive power is useful, but it's limited. And we don't really understand why they do that. So we can com Now, how about if we combine many measurements together? And uh, yeah, this is not me. This is blue. <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, we, can can we combine many measurements together. And then actually, our predictive power will increase. And so for example, here, this is very classic work, again, on lymphoma, on a B-cell lymphoma, a blood cell cancer, by Lou Stout at the National Cancer Institute, where he profiled the activity of many genes. This is so when, the, when, the G, when the color is blue, the gene is highly expressed. When it's green, it's lowly expressed. And here are different tumor samples. And this, so on each row is a gene, and in the first tumor, it's blue, and the second tumor it's green and so forth and if you then order these things you see that there is a pattern that shows you that in those particular tumors these three tumor samples those genes the t first 20 or so are always green so if we measure only one of them then we probably will not have very good predictive power but if we measure all 20 we will be able to tell that this tumor is different than the other 15. So multiple measurements, when taken together, can provide you with more predictive power. So now we begin to see that it, this can get more complex. You can make thousands of measurements and you can de develop a statistical model for this. And so he's used this and has had impact in the clinic to actually take, take histology pathology slides that really look identical for all different people and looked at how these genes are regulated and shown that in fact these identical things actually fall into three classes three different types of cancers that were not evident by looking at the pathology slide and that results in and in fact each of these classes has different outcomes and different responsiveness to different drugs and uh, <clears throat> so doing so has been very useful, but again, I stress that what these genes are, we know that the identity of these genes, we can do the measurements, but how the genes determine the outcome, we don't understand. They simply are measurements that are correlated with outcomes. And so that means this is, these are measurements that are fed into a statistical model that can give us 
some idea about what will happen next, where the, what the prognosis is for the patient and how drugs uh, might respond. So this is, this is beginning to get at the issue of improving diagnosis, personalizing therapy, and of course also reducing cost uh, by having more specific targeted therapies uh, that are more successful. And so uh, we have now, what has happened over the last 10 years is really remarkable in that the measurement capabilities that we, not, we don't only have in the lab, but we actually also have in the clinic, has, has uh, absolutely exploded. We can sequence genomes. We can determine epigenomes, the, how these genes are packaged. We can sequence how these genes are expressed, the transcriptomes, and the, the proteins in every cell. And we also have electronic clinical records, which of course are really important to compare to those molecular level measurements. We can measure the metabolites in every cell and every organ. And we, can, we are aware now that we don't just consist of human cells. We, have, we are in fact uh, housing, if you will, uh, we are functioning as hosts for a huge number of microbes that play essential functions for our health. And so, Generating all this data leads to other challenges. It generates to a huge amount of informatic, computational challenges because the data is not always good or its, heter its quality is heterogeneous. It comes in all kinds of different formats, but we want to combine them. We want to combine all of this data to make better predictions. And we want to understand, given that this data is heterogeneous, what is actually an outlier and what is a no what's part of the normal range? and therefore the information value of these signals and how these, how these, these data sets can, are best combined. And so these are computational challenges that requires medicine, requires life sciences to bring in people, researchers who have very strong computational backgrounds, i.e. bioinformaticians. And so uh, <clears throat> this, uh, this is what is, I think uh, President Obama in his um, in his uh, State of the Union address described as the precision medicine opportunity of combining these awesome measurement capabilities with the fact that we have clinical records together with genome sequence to, have, to really make a difference to individuals and also to healthcare in general. And um, this, re this all is based on a statistical a statistical modeling of developing correlations between different measurements. And UCLA is one of the exciting places because it's got such a phenomenal hospital and it's taking a leadership within the UC system to put those records online, make available to people who do research with proper IRB approvals and, um, and so forth. So this is one reason why we're excited to be here. Now, what is really the holy grail? Well, the holy grail is that we don't just treat disease, but we really are doing precision health care. And what does that mean? That means the doctor should not only be aware of you, the physician should not only be aware of you when you come in sick, but when you're healthy. And so this is where M health or mobile health monitoring is so important. If we, can, if we are able to provide data in our normal daily lives through activity monitors on our watches or other kinds of measurements, through analysis, through heart monitoring, through all kinds of monitors that we, that we might be able to, to wear on our daily lives, we can provide feedback on our health and never make adjustments before we get sick. And that really is the holy grail of precision healthcare rather than treating disease. And again, this, re this involves Measurements that are correlated with health status, therefore a statistical model. Now, I wouldn't be talking to you about this if all this was easy, because <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is in itself is a phenomenal computational challenge, but there is also <clears throat> a fundamental problem with this, because each one of us is different. There are so many different ways that data could be related to each other. There are millions and billions of possibilities. And so actually establishing correlations that are statistically significant 
is very, very hard. It requires vast amount of very good data in itself. And maybe more data than there are people on the planet. And I'm not joking. So this is, this is, this is, there's a fundamental problem in, in making this truly very precise. It will certainly improve things, but it will not make very specific 100% accuracy predictions most of the time. So, what is there an alternative approach? The sky is blue. <laughs> <laughs> On my monitor. <laughs> <clears throat> so, why do I have an airplane here? Well, an airplane is really complex, but it's really predictable, right? It, I looked this up, and Boeing 737 consists of 367,000 parts. We consist of about 20,000 genes, protein coding genes, that code for about 200,000 proteins, and there's a, you know, probably another 20,000 non-coding, non-protein coding genes. And we do have a lot more cells. So we are more complex than airplanes. <clears throat> but airplanes are pretty complex, and assembling them is really, really hard. And yet, they are incredibly safe, even though occasionally we hear horrible news about these. But this is also, I looked this up, one fatality for every two billion miles flown. It's the safest mode of transfor transport, despite the fact that it's so complex. They are predictable. They're so predictable that we can simulate to fly them. We can do simulations of a flight, and that is always used for anybody who wants to be a pilot. And the reason for that is that you don't want to put student pilots in a real airplane. It's just too dangerous. You use flight simulators to learn how to fly. So somehow, there's something really fundamentally different about airplanes than people and healthcare, in that we can simulate the flight of an airplane. We can't simulate health and disease. Not yet, but you, this is where I'm getting at. <laughs> and why, do we, why is this so accurate? Well, it's not based on statistics. It's based on physical principles. We understand if there's a wing, there's a, something called the Bernoulli principle, oops, that allows the wing to provide lift. And there's an equation that you can describe this process for. And therefore, you can design the airplane to maximize lift and to do this completely accurately and completely predictable. You, you understand the process absolutely. So it's the re, the, airplanes are so predictable because we understand the physical principles and they describe the mathematical equations. And so whereas what we're currently doing is we're bridging, we're leapfrogging this gap from or this huge gap from molecules and genes to healthcare through using statistical models, because that's the only thing we can really do. What I'm saying is that we could develop a mechanistic model, a, a mathematical model that can simulate how these molecules are made, how the molecules are interacting, how these, how these interactions lead to cell functions, and how these cell functions develop organ functions and how the organs come together to produce health. Now, that is really, really long-term and really hard. But this is the basic outline of it. If we want to develop mechanistic models, so mechanistic rather than statistical models, we have to identify what the components are in every, at every scale level. We have to learn what the physical principles are that connect them. We need to understand how each of these parts works in the context of that system and the interactions. And then we can build a mathematical or a computational model of this process and simulate it. Sim and then we can connect these models together to produce physiological functions. Now, how do we do that? Well, that's based on knowledge, and knowledge that is gained in the field of biology. And so, uh, why is it so important to think about knowledge? Um, 
Why bother with knowledge-based models when they're so hard to make? You could leapfrog everything with statistics. Here's an example. This guy, Newton, in the 17th century, measured apples falling from a tree of a branch of a certain height. He measured the time it took, and he got a number. Another branch, another apple, another time. He got a bunch of data points. So the first thing we do, he would do, or that people did at that time, is to draw a line through this and say, OK, that's the best fit line. That allows me now to predict if I have another branch, I, do, I can predict another branch of a certain height, it will take this much time. <coughs> and that's true. But how about if you take an Empire State Building and over here, you have to extend that line out. So what Newton did, he said, well, rather than just fitting, doing the best fit line, I want to understand what is the relationship between time gravitational pull of the Earth, and acceleration that the apple feels, the mass of the apple, if it plays a role, it doesn't, and the height of the tree. And he came up with an equation that showed actually the time is not proportional to the height, but proportional to the square root of the height. And it looks like it's a good fit too. The measurements are not that accurate. You can't really figure out what's the right thing. But imagine if you now go to the Empire State Building, this the straight line is going to lead to completely inaccurate predictions. Here's another, here's another example of why it's important to think about knowledge based rather than statistical models. Here, look at, here's some measurements, and one of these people is sick, and you don't know which one. Well, it turns out that that's the outlier. It's not obvious by looking at one piece of data like this. But if you have data, and you realize that these data points actually oscillate, for example, with the circadian cycle that each of us undergoes, then you realize that actually everybody is oscillating except for that green guy, uh, that, well, <laughs> red guy. <laughs> the colors are completely swapped. <laughs> um, um, and so that's the outlier. And you wouldn't know it if you didn't have the knowledge that this is a circadian cycle and you need to measure things longitudinally over, over time. Here's another example of if if, a, it, if there's a response in the body that looks something like this, and you try to make an inhibition, the inhibition could lead to a truncation of the, the oscillations to, to this, or it could, uh, it, get, it could get rid of the oscillations altogether. <coughs> Completely different outcomes with the same drug that you can't necessarily predict unless you have an understanding of what the equation is that gives rise to this. And so, fortunately, this knowledge is being produced in the life sciences and the biology department and the school of medicine in all kinds of different departments that have combinations of these names MIMG, IBP, physiology uh, and this is, this is why this is where we're producing this knowledge and what it takes now is to take this knowledge and integrate it and make mo mathematical models out of it and so <clears throat> The kind of knowledge that has been produced is about how, what genes do, the enzymatic functions, the drug interactions, the molecular networks, um, feedback mechanisms, redundancies, the synergies between genes, all kinds of stuff like this. And so when uh, UCLA had the wisdom to develop an institute around uh, this idea of bringing uh, of addressing the challenges of big data, I was very, very excited and I was very pleased that I was able to come here. And this is the idea, that the big data, the awesome measurement capabilities, the electronic clinical data, demand huge amounts of informatic expertise that we have to provide and we can develop statistical models for it that affect not only the biosciences, the life sciences, but also make a contribution to precision medicine, or in fact are essential to precision medicine. But the other aspect is that there's also big knowledge. There's a huge amount of knowledge that's accumulated over the last 100 years in these disciplines of life sciences that are based on molecular biology, biochemistry, and genetics. It's incredibly useful in interpreting this data, but we have to have the right <coughs> mathematical descriptions for this. And it's not only statistics. And so, uh, it's really about developing expertise and a cadre of faculty who are addressing this challenge 
of developing algorithms. Because the algorithms that are available, correlation statistics, differential equations, are not sufficient. The data is just too, the, the challenges are too broad and too complex, and we don't yet actually know what kind of math is really required for all of this. And so, in, the, in our new Institute for Quantitative Computation Biosciences, we combine faculty from a variety of different places, different uh, departments, that have expertise in statistical genetics, genomics and in bioinformatics, how to, how to make databases, how to think about privacy, which is also about information, about molecular networks, dynamical systems, structural informatics and multi-scale modeling. And I'm by no means an expert at any of these. <laughs> but I love the fact that I'm able to interact with people and so I can learn. And so this, of course, is embedded in the big four players on campus of life sciences with all of its departments of health, of, of the medical school, of health, the health systems and engineering with computer science and so forth. And so uh, we attempt to facilitate collaboration, communication, and develop excellence in this area of developing algorithms and interpreting data. Oops, everybody's blue here. And here's some of the people <laughs> and, uh, at Halloween. <laughs> and we have a mission that extends the research to research training with graduate training and master's training and of course to education at the graduate and also undergraduate level. And so uh, now I can tell you maybe in the last uh, few minutes uh, a little bit about one short vignette about the kind of work that is actually going on in my lab and I see actually one or two people from my group here. And, uh, and this has to do with immune responses. And the example that I will tell you about is not about, we're not yet attempting to really go from DNA all the way to humans. But we're making a small contribution and trying to understand how these molecular networks work that are really critical for immune, immune responses and how they in turn control the functions of cells. And so it's this connection that I'll tell you a little bit about. And so Immune, re immune responses are controlled by many different cell types, including the tissue cells that might be infected by pathogens, but also then macrophages and dendritic cells you may have heard about, and lymphocytes, T and B cells, and of course neutrophils. And they function in, in over a sequence of days, hours and days and weeks, to provide immunity. And, um, and that has to be very finely controlled because uncontrolled immunity also leads to disease. So these networks, this molecular network is actually pretty much is, is in every of these cells has a similar structure but is subtly different in every cell. And it, the structure looks like this. <laughs> so uh, this is the base. This is really where somebody very diligent tried to bring all the knowledge together that has been accumulated over many years. And as a diagram like that, it's not particularly useful. I, I, I agree with you. But it is absolutely essential to then de develop a ma mathematical model that leads to a simulation. Think, you know, if you think about the flight simulator and you try to put the lines of code all on a piece of paper like, or on a slide like this, it would be completely unintelligible. It would make no sense and it would be, you know, we'd all be laughing. And so this is sort of similar to this, but if you then actually write the code, let the computer figure it out, the simulations could be very useful. And so that's what we're attempting to do. We're not trying to do the whole thing yet, but we're trying to do a little piece here that we know is really, really important for immunity. And that's a transcription factor, a protein that binds DNA that controls the responses of many cells to pathogens. And that's called NF-kappa B. And this is... Uh, this is our favorite protein, and it's the favorite protein of many people who also study it. We're not the only ones who are crazy enough, but uh, <laughs> this is the thing. And, and this protein is over here. It, um, it's, it's 
orange and red on my slide. <laughs> but <clears throat> it, uh, here it's in the nucleus and binds DNA and expresses genes. And the way it's regulated is that it, it, if it's in the cytoplasm, it can't do anything because there are no genes in the cytoplasm. So if it goes into the nucleus, it can bind genes. So really, there is this, protein, this other set of proteins, these I B proteins, that bind it and inhibit it from, bind, from, from targeting genes and take it back out of, the nucle out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm. And then there's this other enzyme here that causes these I Bs to be degraded. Now you get the idea. If there's lots of I Bs there, no NF kappa B. If the I Bs got degraded, lots of NF kappa B, and they activate genes. And so this is how it's controlled. This enzyme is controlled by the pathogens. Path if the se if cell senses pathogens, enzyme gets active, I Bs are degraded, NF kappa B goes in. And then these I kappa Bs get resynthesized, remade, go back, take NF kappa B out of the nucleus, back out. Now it's inactive again. And so we can write equations for this process. You know, so some people have been studying this, probably more than a dozen laboratories have contributed to a uh, complete mechanistic understanding of this process. And we can now write equations for this, for how much mRNA there is at any time, or how much NFKB is in the nucleus at any time. And it's a function of all of these different terms that we now under, that we understand quite well. And so we can do simulations. And here's a simulation in response to a cytokine, inflammatory cytokine TNF, NFKB is rapidly activated, is downregulated by more ICLA Bs being synthesized, and then settles at some half level. And we can make simulations, we can also make predictions about these other regulators in that pathway, these ICLA Bs. And now, is this simulation true? Well, we can do an experiment. Here is the experiment. We see normally there's no NF kappa B, then NF kappa B goes up, and it's up at about 15 minutes, and that coincides with what the simulation said. And then it goes back down at 75 minutes back down. And here you see it's down right after the one hour mark. And then it goes back up and is like that. And that kind of looks like the simulation. So this is what was really exciting, that if you have an understanding of the mechanism, you can actually simulate some small part of biology. And here's the same thing. Here's NFKB. Now, in a live cell movie, NFKB in... I guess blue, <laughs> normally red. Uh, and you see it goes into the nucleus and back out again, just like what we saw in the simulations. So it looks like these simulations actually work. And now we've extended this to really, so here, are, here is a diagram where if it's blue, NFKB is up, and every line here is one cell. So we're looking at thousands of cells, and you see that NFKB is, is is increased and then goes down. But you see that not all cells look to do the same thing. They are now ordered here, and you see that some cells have a lot of NFKB activity and some have less, and they're not completely synchronous to each other, so all cells are slightly different from each other. And the new simulation work actually is able to capture that. And here's a few, here's a few cells. One cell looks like this, up with NFKB, another one looks like that, another one like that. And look at our simulations that match these cells. They look pretty good. And so we are able to capture with our simulations pretty subtle effects that the cells are doing. And so we're pretty excited about this. And this is the work of uh, current members in the laboratory, graduate student Brooks Taylor and uh, Frank Chang, who is a postdoc. So I think we're beginning to have a good way of doing this. And there's many more studies, of course, that are specific to immune cells. But how about Ultimately, what NFKB is doing is affecting cell functions. So we need to understand what the cells are doing. And so here are some cells that are B cells. And this movie was taken by a current postdoc in the lab, uh, Kushik Roy. Mm -hmm. They're very small cells, and the movie goes for about a minute. And it doesn't look like much is happening. These cells are B cells that have seen an antigen. And what's happening is they're getting fatter. Some of them are getting fatter, some of them are dying. And the fatter ones are beginning to divide. And then they grow more, and they divide again. And so they continue, so, but some cells are also dying. 
So even though these cells are genetically identical, they're not all doing exactly the same thing. There's some level of variability, some stochasticity that happens. And then at some point, the cells are actually getting tired. Up here is the timeline. We're now looking at 90 hours. So this is an, and 100 hours under the microscope. So we have these microscopes that take movies of these cells, and we can now see what the cells are doing. And now most of them are dying off. And they've, they've done their job, and now they're dead. But so what is, well, if we want to understand this process of cells, some of the cells dying and some of the cells are dividing, and they're doing it not completely, they don't all have the same fate. We need to think about how NFKB is controlling cell death, or otherwise called apoptosis here, cell death, and it's inhibiting cell death, we know that, but only in some cells, not in all. And then it's also contributing to the increase in mass and the volume of the cell and the mass, and then, this, and then the control of the cell cycle that determines when the cells are actually di dividing and splitting in two. And so there are mathematical models that other groups, here this group of Peter Sorga at MIT or John Tyson at the University of Virginia, have developed over many years with similar painstaking work of trying to figure out what these, how these mechanisms can be described mathematically. And what we're doing here is we're stitching these models, mathematical models, together in a puzzle where we are experts of this model, they're experts of this, and we're trying to fit them together. And how do we fit them together is that we need to actually take these measurements from the scope that we do. <coughs> and, you know, looking at the movie like this doesn't give us all the information. We need to know how long a cell took to grow in size and, how long, and when it divided and what, how big the mass was when it decided to divide and how many cells died and when they died and what the time was. And so to get that, you can watch a cell by hand in, over the 90 or 100 hours and make notes. And you can do that for the next cell for the next 90 hours. And you'll be sitting there for a couple of years to look at this one week movie. <laughs> so this is a big data challenge. So the way you need to develop algorithms, this is an example, of actually tracking these cells with image analysis tools, computational image analysis tools that will then give us this information. And that's what Max did. And he... Uh, and for this work, we now get lineage information. And here's time zero, and it's 120 hours. And you see that many cells in the zeroth generation, this is what I call the zeroth generation, they haven't divided yet, actually die. They never do anything. Many cells then decide to grow, and then they divide once. And here's the first generation in green, and the second generation in blue, and the third generation in purple, and the fourth generation in yellow, I guess, and fifth. And so you can see that cells are not all doing the same thing, but there are some similarities. For example, you see that the red line is very different in length. The time it, they spend in generation zero is very variable, but the times in generation one, two, three, four are very constant. Once they decided to undergo a proliferative program, they'll do that for a bit until they poop out, and then they might s sit there for a while before they die. So uh, our model... So we can describe these different generations here also in color. The, the, full gener the full population looked like that. At first, many cells died, and then, then the cells started dividing, and the population grew, and then everybody pooped out and died off. And if you look at the, if you look at the generations, here's generation zero, and I think in red, and then generation one, two, three, four, five, contributed to this overall population. And this is also what we see in the experiments. So you can see here that there's a, fit, a qualitative match. It's not perfect, but we're getting there. We're getting, if this is the experiment that is the analysis of this data, it begins to look similar. We're beginning to be able to account for the population measurements uh, in terms of the mathematical description of, the, of how, the, how genes are interacting with each other. So we're predicting cell populations based on the molecular network where we have a molecular network, that molecular network describes the decisions that cells make to either die, survive, or proliferate, and we can thereby make predictions about the, popu the populations. And this is all done so far just in a dish, in a lab, 
but the next step, of course, to try to do this in vaccine recipients and figure out what it is that allows some people to have a really good vaccine response, some have a devastating vaccine response, and some maybe not to have any response and, un and leave with no protection. And so we begin to fill this in. We have a lot more work to do. And Halloween picture, Max was really the graduate student who pushed this B-cell project forward. And, um, uh, and so he's uh, moved on and, uh, to continue his career. And we have new postdocs and graduate students to work on this. And I thank you for your attention.